Hello, and welcome to the fifth lecture in modern uh, political theory. By now, you should have, uh, I hope you have, uh, a good general grasp of Hobbes's understanding of the social contract and how he thinks that a social contract with the distinctive structure he recommends is the best and indeed the only way that human beings can cooperate together to overcome the problems of conflict uh, and insecurity that he thinks would plague a state of nature. I hope that uh, that much is by now uh, clear. Um, in this lecture and the next, um, and these two lectures will conclude my discussion of Hobbes for this course, um, I'm going to shift the focus a little bit and talk about the upshot of the argument to try to describe the leading features of the kind of state that emerges from Hobbes's uh, argument. So I'm going to discuss some questions about what a Hobbesian state looks like, uh, some of the problems and questions that it uh, gives rise to, um, and that's the main focus for this lecture and the next one. But there's a couple of outstanding things about the social contract that I want to um, emphasize before we get there. Um, the, the first thing I want to stress is that I think it's important not to take Hobbes's argument about the social contract as intended as any kind of histo historically accurate uh, explanation or description of the way in which any particular state has actually come to be in the world. He's not really interested in historical questions or in empirical questions about how states develop uh, as a matter of fact. Um, he's rather interested in offering, I want to suggest, something like a kind of thought experiment um, that is intended to highlight um, and bring to light the terms on which you and everybody else relate rationally to each other through the institution of state sovereignty. Um, when I say that it's intended to be a thought experiment, I think it's important to keep in mind, and I mentioned this a couple of lectures ago, that for Hobbes, the paradigm of science is not so much empirical inquiry. Here, he's actually a little bit different from Francis Bacon, for whom um, he served as a secretary, as you know, and from whom you read uh, uh, early on in the semester. Um, his paradigm for science and scientific inquiry is given by highly deductive forms of investigation. And he's thinking here mainly of things like geometry, logic, uh, mathematics. And just as a logician or a geometer uh, offers a certain kind of mental experiment to explain how to prove uh, a theorem in geometry, similarly, Hobbes thinks of himself as offering a kind of thought experiment that is intended to bring out the nature of our relationship to uh, the state. Um, although, of course, it's like, uh, and it's intended as being like, a geometry kind of proof or argument, it's, of course, in another sense, unlike anything that you're going to encounter in geometry or logic, because as I was stressing earlier on, it's a thought experiment that is addressed to our introspection, right? It's a thought experiment that isn't about inert objects like triangles and circles and tangents. Um, it's an argument that purports, anyway, to address things like our feelings, our appetites, our motivations, and how our motivations relate to the motivations of others. So in that sense, it has a slightly unfamiliar feel to it. But I nonetheless think that it's a mistake to suppose that what um, Hobbes is trying to do is to offer a kind of empirical psychology. Um, I think what he's doing is a much more introspective kind of psychology um, intended, as I say, to highlight uh, how we relate in a rational way to the institutions of state power. So remember Hobbes's overall strategy. His thought is that by looking inside ourselves, um, guided by careful axiomatic stipulations about appetites, aversions, voluntary action, self-preservation, and so forth, by engaging in that kind of operation, that kind of intellectual operation, but turned inward uh, introspectively, uh, we're going to be able 
through Hobbes's discussion, to identify certain rational dispositions that we can all certify that everybody shares. In particular, the overriding disposition to survive, the overriding voluntary desire to uh, secure one's self-preservation, the disposition to hold one another to account before whichever rules the sovereign that we establish um, uh, chooses to enforce as a way to uh, preserve our lives. Um, and thirdly, the disposition to regard that sovereign as, in a sense, representing everyone's desire to secure themselves, right? Uh, that's what Hobbes is trying to do. By looking inside ourselves, he thinks we'll be able, in effect, to find the other, to find other people in ourselves, um, and that will then enable us to make progress with the question of how we together author or construct or constrate, uh, um, uh, construct uh, this um, uh, artificial being that he calls the sovereign state. One question that might um, occur to you here is, you might ask, well, is Hobbes making a consent argument? That is, is Hobbes arguing um, that the basis for state sovereignty is the fact of people's actual consent to it? Um, and I think the answer to this question is a little bit complicated. Um, I think the answer, unfortunately, is yes and no. <laughs> um, I think the answer is no in the sense that I don't think Hobbes's argument turns on uh, or requires the idea that if we look around at our fellow citizens and ask, well, have people actually signed on the dotted line? Have people actually explicitly given their consent to any of this? Um, I, I don't think <clears throat> Hobbes's argument is postulating that people have, in fact, explicitly agreed to the terms of the social contract as he understands them. Um, and in a way, that's good news for Hobbes, because, of course, if that were his intention, you could falsify the argument immediately. Uh, because, of course, none of us, or very, very few of us, perhaps some of you who've naturalized into a new state, will actually have expressly uh, made an oath or signed a piece of paper saying, I now agree uh, to obey or whatever. But aside from those exceptional cases, the vast majority of us have never been asked to give our explicit consent to the terms on which we associate politically with our fellows. We're born into a political society, and we're just expected to obey as a matter of course, and nobody bothers to ask us. Uh, so uh, in a way, it's good news for Hobbes's argument that it doesn't, I think, turn on that kind of claim, on a claim about the observable fact that people have consented, um, because then his argument would look very implausible, because we could falsify it just by saying, well, people haven't signed any such contract, or I don't remember ever signing any such contract. But I think there's another sense in which one could see Hobbes's argument as a kind of consent argument, um, in that, uh, based on what I was saying on the previous slide and in earlier lectures, it seems to me that Hobbes's argument is supposed to reveal the following. First, it's rational for you to surrender your right of nature to a sovereign. That is, if you go through the thought experiment of the state of nature and imagine yourself into that situation, you will be compelled uh, logically and motivationally to agree with Hobbes that in that situation you would be prepared to surrender your right of nature and agree with everybody else to establish a sovereign. That's step one. Um, secondly, uh, we're in a position to know that everyone in a state of nature would be similarly disposed towards the problems of the state of nature. And so we're able to know that everybody else would also think that it's rational for them to surrender uh, their right of nature to a sovereign. Um, and therefore, Hobbes thinks he's entitled, might be wrong about this, but this is how I think the argument is supposed to work. Um, Hobbes thinks that we can conclude, and this is the third point on your screen, um, that since we all know that we all know uh, our dispositions to surrender our right of nature, we all know that we all know that we're disposed to relate to each other through a sovereign state as Hobbes describes it. Um, and if that argument goes through, um, Hobbes thinks that 
we can presume that insofar as the people around us are rational, they are tacitly agreeing to go along with the terms of his social contract, right? This isn't the same thing as them actually signing on a dotted line. It's a matter of our being able to make a certain kind of presumption of our fellow rational creatures uh, that they're all basically oriented to the state in the same way um, and, and have overriding reasons uh, to do so. So in that sense, I think one can see Hobbes's argument as a kind of consent argument. Um, read that way, um, I think we're able to see uh, that Hobbes is perfectly aware of something that will, of course, have occurred to um, virtually all of you as you read this, um, namely that, of course, none of us has ever actually participated in a pure social contract that institutes uh, for the first time a new sovereign, right? None of us has ever actually been in a state of nature in Hobbes's pure sense, and none of us can recall ever having been in that situation and then banded together with our fellows to construct a new state, right? Um, and Hobbes knows that perfectly well, but he doesn't think that it damages his argument because he thinks that on the strength of the consideration, he, considerations he gives in the book, he thinks that's enough for all of us to recognize that in choosing to reside permanently within a state, we all implicitly do face the decision whether to sign or not sign on to the social contract as he describes it, right? Um, Hobbes's point goes something like this. I mean, we're all born into states, right? We, 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 we're never, we never start in the state of nature, really. We're just involuntarily born into states that already have constituted uh, states. Um, and given that, we're already in a position to recognize who bears sovereign power in that jurisdiction by certain fairly familiar, what he calls, marks of sovereignty, right? He explicitly says there are certain, there are certain standard symbols um, or images uh, or facts about certain people or, as opposed to other people that enable us in the first instance to recognize who holds sovereignty around here. And the marks of sovereignty uh, that he lists in Leviathan and in some of his other works include uh, the ability to make and, uh, and repeal laws, the ability to decide on war and peace in an international setting, um, the capacity to hear and decide disputes in court, the operation of what we would call the rule of law, the ability to choose magistrates, ministers, judges, counselors, and to institute government agencies, right? I mean, as we grow up and understand the world in which we live, we don't have any great difficulty understanding that Congress, I mean, we recognize Congress, the building, right, in Washington, D.C., and we understand that's the place where laws are passed. We know what a law court is. Um, we know who has government power because they have certain kinds of identity cards, certain kinds of passports, certain kinds of uh, official documents that entitle them uh, to do things. Um, so we already can recognize who the sovereign is, Hobbes thinks, as we grow up um, and mature in the societies in which we actually live. Um, here, I think it's important to notice that included in the marks of sovereignty, Hobbes uh, would, I think, um, uh, add certain kinds of symbols and images um, and forms of clothing that make apparent to us that certain people are officials of the state and others are not, right? So think of, think of police uniforms or military uniforms, right? Um, police uniforms or the, or the special um, marks on police cars and the flashing lights on the top, right? They all make known to us that the people who are driving those cars or the people who are wearing those uniforms, they are bearing the marks of sovereignty, right? They, they, they are uh, recognized conventionally as officials of the state. Uh, similarly, national symbols, flags, coats of arms, um, seals of office, right? Letterheads. Th these all enable us in the first instance to know before any of Hobbes's arguments get going, 
who in our society bears sovereignty. Um, since I mentioned seals of office, uh, I want to just have a quick aside here um, and show you the great seal of the United States uh, of America, which is on your uh, slide here, because I think it bears an interesting and perhaps rather telling comparison with the famous cover page of Hobbes's Leviathan, uh, which I was talking about a few lectures ago. I mean, people tend to think, well, this is, you know, they read Hobbes and they think, well, this this terrifying monster, it's an interesting idea, but it's basically a 17th century idea. It doesn't have any real application today. We don't think of state power like that anymore. But actually, if you look at the Great Seal of the United States, it's surprisingly uh, resonant with the front cover of Hobbes's Leviathan. What do we see? I mean, there are differences, of course, but it, it's in many ways uh, another version of what you see in Hobbes. Um, so let's take a close look at this diagram for just a, a, a second. The central figure, of course, is an eagle, um, and the eagle is representing the United States of America there. Now, it's important to think about what kind of animal an eagle is, right? An eagle isn't just any old kind of bird. Um, an, an eagle is a bird of prey, right? It, it swoops out of the sky picks up little animals and eats them, right? This is not a Pacific um, nice little bird like a cardinal, right? This is, this is a bird uh, that behaves in a pretty aggressive, predatory uh, kind of way. So we're not a million miles away from uh, Hobbes's fire-breathing reptilian monster. Now, we don't have the feathers of the bird representing individual citizens, in the way that the scales of Hobbes's Leviathan do. But instead, what we have is the beak of the uh, uh, eagle uh, holding a little ribbon on which is emblazoned the Latin tag, a pluribus unum. And of course, what that translates as is from many one. And I don't think it's fanciful to say that that's not that different from the little scales on Hobbes's monster, because what it what it's saying is that there are many individuals, but in the United States they fuse into one, a civic a civic unity, right? And notice the other things that are on this. Uh, that there's a shield, right, that represents uh, defense uh, and and security. The right talon of the bird is holding uh, a, a, a bran an olive branch which of course represents peace and the desire to secure uh, peace and order. But the left hand of the, or the left talon of the eagle is clutching a bunch of arrows, right? Weapons, right? And again, uh, that's not that different from Hobbes's Leviathan wielding uh, in its right hand uh, the sword, right? So it's not, I think, completely fanciful to say that our existing marks of sovereignty are surprisingly quite close to the iconography that Hobbes uses to uh, define his own view. So keep, keep that in mind. Um, in any event, Hobbes thinks that we already know by the time we're sort of uh, entering late adolescence, we already basically know who the sovereign is and we know how to recognize who are the sovereign's officials. Uh, we associate it with the law courts, with Congress, the legislature, and so forth. We have these seals that represent sovereign power and, and so forth. So we're already in a position when we're born into a society and, and, and grow up in it to know who the sovereign is. Hobbes thinks that once we're in that situation, the only remaining question for each of us is, do we then agree with everybody else to obey uh, whoever bears the marks of sovereignty? Um, or do we go to the trouble of explicitly refusing and saying, I'm not, I don't want to be part of any of this, right? I explicitly say that I do not want to agree with all of you in uh, 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 committing myself to uh, obeying those who bear the marks of sovereignty. But if you do that, of course, what you're effectively doing is reestablishing the state of nature between you and everybody who is party to this particular state, who is a party to the social contract, right? 
And that, Hobbes thinks, is tantamount to declaring war on everybody in your society. And of course, since the sovereign bears the right of nature, the sovereign could simply decide to eliminate you, destroy you at will, because he then, or it then, judges you to be a threat. Um, and Hobbes's gambit basically is that since that's the choice we always face in deciding whether to accept or explicitly reject the sovereignty that is co constituted in the, in the society in which we reside, since that's always the choice we face, um, no rational person would ever actually choose B on my slide over A, because none of us are so stupid as to declare war as an individual against the full might of the constituted sovereign that exists in our society. And that's the way I take it that Hobbes's uh, um, social contract argument is supposed to work and how it's supposed to show that we can presume that insofar as we're all rational, we all do, in fact, uh, for practical purposes, we can be presumed to be uh, signing on to the social contract pretty much as Hobbes describes it. Okay, uh, that's uh, all I want to say about the structure of the contract and uh, the way it uh, is supposed to work in his argument. Um, let me now turn to talking about the structure of the Hobbesian sovereign uh, that emerges, the, the, the character of the state that Hobbes um, recommends uh, in his arguments. And that's going to now be the, the topic for the remainder of uh, the lectures on Hobbes in this class. First of all, and you already know this, uh, the sovereign has uh, is understood in Hobbes' theory to have a primary responsibility. Right? Its main raison d'être is collective self-preservation, organizing social life, um, institutional structures, so that they are as far as possible conducive to the survival and security of citizens. Right? And that's roughly speaking what we would often today call national security, as I was talking about uh, uh, the other day. Keep in mind that Hobbes's sovereign doesn't have to be a single person, doesn't have to be a mon monarch, a king or a queen. Um, Hobbes is quite explicit that you can imagine sovereign states in which sovereignty is held by many people, as in an oligarchy or an aristocracy, some kind of society in which a council of people, as opposed to a single individual, hold sovereignty and make sovereign decisions about national uh, security. And it can even be organized in a completely democratic way, so that the sovereign uh, turns out to be, in some sense, all of us together, deciding together on how we should um, preserve ourselves, perhaps by some principle of majority rule, which in general Hobbes seems to think is make, make sense in that kind of context. Um, so don't make the mistake of thinking that Hobbes assumes that the sovereign always has to be a single individual. He does, as you know, uh, offer some arguments as to why he thinks it's better to organize the state as a monarchy as opposed to uh, an oligarchy or a democracy. Um, but his argument doesn't preclude the possibility that the sovereign could be democratically organized. Um, and I'll come back to that point because, of course, it bears on the question of how a country like the United States um, could be assimilated to Hobbes's model. And what I'll be saying there is that the best way to um, render the United States into a Hobbesian framework is to see the United States as a society whose sovereign is in some sense uh, a democratic body. But I'll, I'll, I'll explain the sense in which that's so uh, later on. Um, the sovereign, of course, reserves the right of nature. And that's what gives it uh, these um, uh, uh, extremely strong powers to control and regulate uh, social life. Because the right of nature, under Hobbes's formula, gives the state an effective monopoly on the right to coerce citizens to do what it thinks is necessary to preserve the lives of uh, the state's members. So uh, the state can use coercion to get citizens to contribute uh, in the form of taxation, various kinds of resources and money, 
uh, to uh, uh, establishing institutions that will conduce to people's self-defense, and other forms of resources, labor, energy, uh, uh, etc., to uh, uh, helping to secure the lives of members of society. Um, because the sovereign reserves the right of nature, Hobbes has an easy way to respond to a puzzle that I mentioned right at the beginning of all of this. Remember, I said, look, one of the puzzles about state authority is that the state reserves the right to do things like imprisoning people or executing people or torturing people that ordinarily private individuals can't do. And that's a puzzle about uh, uh, the nature of state power as we understand it. But of course, Hobbes has a neat way of resolving that puzzle because his social contract enables us to say, well, the sovereign retains the right of nature that we've all laid down in the state of nature. So the sovereign remains free to do all of the things that we might have done individually in the state of nature, killing others, harming others, taking property from others, or possessions, I should say, since property won't exist in the state of nature. Um, uh, the sovereign retains that right, but in surrendering the right of nature to each other, we lose that right. And that uh, enables Hobbes' argument to explain how the state can do a bunch of stuff that individual private citizens can no longer rightfully do. Um, notice, this is an interesting thing for you to think about, that foreign individuals under Hobbes' analysis are always going to be in a state of nature with all other states. Right? So the state of nature isn't completely eliminated in Hobbes' argument. It simply um, it gravitates to the international level. The state of nature continues to exist uh, between states because there is no overarching global sovereign uh, that regulates our interaction. And as long as that's true, states retain the right of nature vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, and it's interesting, I, 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 I suggest, to reflect on our rather ambiguous attitudes to that, right? Um, Compare our attitudes to the 2018 Novichok poisonings in Britain. You will remember that uh, almost certainly, it's not completely clear what happened, um, but almost certainly agents of the Russian FSB went to Salisbury in the south of England um, in an attempt to poison uh, two Russian citizens, one of whom was by then a naturalized UK citizen, um, and he, the naturalite, Mr. Skripal, if you remember, um, he had formerly been a member of the um, uh, Russian FSB um, and had been a double agent for the British. Um, and so as part of a spy swap, he had uh, eventually uh, come to reside in the United States. But at least on the one theory of why the poisoning was authorized, uh, the Putin government was angry that Skripal uh, had uh, betrayed uh, Russia and sent agents to poison the Skripals, because they also poisoned his daughter, who had nothing to do with any of this. She was, she was just a daughter. Uh, she didn't, wasn't involved in the security forces or uh, intelligence or anything like that. She wasn't a spy. Um, they went to Salisbury to poison them with this highly toxic nerve agent called Novichok. Um, they failed, in fact, to kill uh, uh, the two targets, but they successfully killed... Um, uh, to British nationals, innocent third parties, uh, um, uh, who picked up one of these discarded bottles of Novichok, thinking it was perfume, um, and sprayed this uh, uh, deadly nerve agent on their on their arm. Uh, and there were two people who were affected by that. One of whom went on uh, went on to die. And of course, you know, we we look at that. And, and we express, you know, how appalling, how terrible this is, right? But of course, from a Hobbesian point of view, this is just the sort of thing that, you know, in the international sphere, states uh, are, are going to have and assert the right to do, because states reserve the right of nature. So the relationship between individuals internationally um, inherits the horrifying, conflictual, and violent nature of Hobbes's uh, state of nature. Right. Um, but it's interesting, I think, and you should think about this, that when we when we are told about the Novichok poisonings uh, in 2018, we get all appalled and upset. But on the other hand, when we go and see a James Bond movie and everybody uh, takes for granted that James Bond has, as we put it, a license to kill, uh, including killing innocent civilians. I mean, if, anytime you see a, a Bond movie, you, you know, there are plenty of 
innocent third parties who get kind of clearly injured in car chases, right? Uh, you, you know, James Bond's car goes through a market and all these people's livelihoods and their physical bodies are, are, are harmed. Um, we think that James Bond license to kill is, is good, clean fun. Um, but you should ask yourself, I mean, is that really a stable set of attitudes or do we in fact, uh, on reflection, agree with, sovereign, uh, agree with Hobbes that this is basically how the rights uh, are, are, are set up? Um, the Hobbesian state gives life and meaning to the idea of a people who share a common interest, a common interest in security uh, and self-preservation. And that aspect of the Hobbesian position, I think, strongly resonates with the way we often talk about lawsuits, right? Uh, when we talk about a criminal case in the law, we talk about the case, we name the case, the people versus Smith. The people there are the sovereign prosecuting, accusing Smith, in this case, the person who is accused of a crime, of having violated uh, the, 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 the social contract, right? Um, so it's interesting that we uh, still, in a way, talk this way uh, about, um, about the state as representing we the people. And that's, that, that's an understanding that is fairly clearly visible in the way we talk about lawsuits as an adversarial dispute between we the people and some individual who stands accused of violating the laws. Keep in mind, though, going back to something I was stressing earlier on, that civic unity in Hobbes' sense is an artifact. It is not something natural. And that's very important to see because it's a mistake, although some critics have often done this, it's, it's a mistake to think of Hobbes as a kind of totalitarian um, who is interested in a kind of politics uh, that erects state authority on some kind of identity, like a national identity, or a racial identity, or an ethnic identity, or an ideological project, or a religious um, uh, uh, project, right? Um, that's not Hobbes's view at all. Uh, the civic bond, the civic unity that Hobbes's social contract establishes, is not based on primordial nationalism. It's not based on a shared skin color or a shared uh, a cultural outlook on our shared commitment to an ideology, but to something, but rather it's based on something that all human beings share um, just as such, and that is an interest in survival, right? So it's a mistake to think of Hobbes, for example, as a defender of the divine right of kings, because the idea, that, and this was a pre prevalent idea in the 17th century in Europe, but of course, the divine right of kings implies that the source of authority lies in some religious doctrine um, and ultimately on some uh, uh, ordination by God. But Hobbes is denying that, right? Um, that the civic bond is not based on something God has ordained. It's based on something much more intimate, namely our personal and basic human interest in survival. Um, China, about whom I'll talk in a moment again, is an interesting case. Uh, because in lots of ways, uh, the Chinese government behaves in a completely Hobbesian uh, way. Um, and I think Hobbes would have no problem with the various ways that the Chinese government is uh, 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 conducting itself. But China's a bit, of, a, a bit of a departure from Hobbes because it remains, at least on paper, uh, committed to a Marxist ideology um, and to realizing uh, a communist future. Um, and that side of uh, Chinese uh, political authority, Hobbes would say, is really an irrelevance, right? And, and perhaps a confusion and something that is um, uh, getting in the way. Uh, the Chinese state, for Hobbes, like all states, its basic raison d'etre is security and survival. Um, you know, some doctrine, some ideology uh, that comes from some philosophical source, that's something that Hobbes would regard as, as um, tangential to state state's basic um, modus operandi. So uh, the Hobbesian state is oriented towards promoting security, but notice that Hobbes understands security in a very broad way. It certainly includes uh, pro prohibitions on force, fraud, and theft. It includes ensuring that citizens aren't uh, vulnerable to murder, to assault, to rape, to theft of their property and so forth. It includes all of that, but it's broader than that. The Hobbesian state 
and its interest in pursuing uh, security extends also to the adoption of pragmatic rules and orders and commands that are intended to protect life in other ways. Things like traffic rules, right? We have speed limits because we want to make sure that people aren't driving at such uh, a speed uh, that it endangers the lives of others. We want to have our cars inspected to make sure that they're not exploding um, and crashing into each other on the road and therefore endangering life. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration, making sure that the food that is on the shelves of our supermarket isn't going to poison us and threaten our survival. That, too, is all part of the security brief of the Hobbesian uh, sovereign. And, of course, in our contemporary environment, um, lockdowns, quarantines, vaccinations, including forced vaccinations and forced lockdowns and forced quarantines as ways to protect the lives of citizens from diseases and pandemics, that too is all part of security as the Hobbesian state understands it, because diseases are just, a mu just as much threats to people's self-preservation as are rapes and assaults and um, murders. Um, also on that point, and here there's a very, very clear difference between Hobbes and Locke, which I'll get, be getting into next time or next week, um, for Hobbes, property rights are not absolute because they're not independent of the state. There is no property in the state of nature. Property only comes into existence after the state has defined the terms on which property has, can be held and defined legal rules for adjudicating disputes about who stole from whom, right? Um, because property rights are the creatures of the state, uh, they're not absolute rights that stand apart from state power. Um, and Hobbes is very clear about that in chapter 2910, uh, for example. Um, and that means that uh, Hobbes's Leviathan is free to redistribute wealth and property in whatever ways it sees fit, right? Uh, so there's no general problem about redistributive taxation on a Hobbesian uh, view, and that's worth keeping in mind. Um, some contemporary defenders of a Lockean view, some of you will have read Robert Nozick's famous 1974 book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which argues on a Lockean basis that redistributive taxation for, say, a welfare state is a kind of forced labor, right? Because you're making the wealthy um, uh, uh, give up some of their legitimately earned income to support uh, the welfare of other members of society without their consent, right? Um, and that's a problem in the Lockean framework, as we'll see when we do Locke. But for Hobbes, taxation, even redistributive taxation to help the poor, that's no more forced labor than is any other kind of state coercion. And I think it's worth mentioning here, too, that, of course, the most popular um, and most basic welfare program in the United States, um, uh, namely the Social Security program, uh, you should notice the name of that program. It's called the Social Security uh, program. And that tendency to uh, uh, relate economic well-being and economic uh, survival, in this case in old age, when you're no longer in a position probably to uh, hold down a job and receive uh, an income, uh, social security, it secures the livelihoods of people who are past the age of being able to work. Um, and that way of thinking about welfare as a form of security um, is completely, I think, consistent with the Hobbesian, Hobbesian outlook. Hobbesian sovereignty is absolute, legally unlimited, and despotic. And that's so because its powers are defined by the right of nature. Uh, as you know. I mentioned China. Um, here in uh, 2017 is the Chinese Chief Justice Zhu Shang saying, quote, China should resolutely resist erroneous influence from the West, constitutional democracy, separation of powers, independence of the ju judiciary. We must make clear our stand and dare to show the sword. Um, uh, there are some things in this uh, uh, statement that are very, very close to Hobbes. Um, I will suggest in a moment that there's a way in which Hobbes can actually defend uh, the independence of the judiciary. Um, but on its face, Hobbes' official view is that the judiciary is not independent of the sovereign. It's simply an agent 
uh, of the sovereign. And certainly Hobbes was no fan of the separation of powers, if by the separation of powers one means divided sovereignty, because uh, Hobbes insists that sovereignty must be one and indivisible. You can't break it up and divide it, because as soon as you do that, you create the possibility of civil war, you create the possibility of confusion among citizens about where the seat of sovereignty uh, really lies, and that's a potentially dangerous thing uh, for Hobbes. But what Shang says here, I want to suggest to you, is a completely uh, faithful Hobbesian statement, right? And it's ironic because, of course, China is depicted here as a society that is resisting erroneous influence from the West. But in fact, of course, uh, Shang is here simply articulating um, an orthodox Hobbesian view uh, about state uh, power. So it's not, it's not really quite right to say that the position that he's taking uh, is not one that you can find in Western political theory, because Hobbes would be, I think, completely at one with Zhu Shang in, in this statement. The sovereign is above the law, because the law is the creature of the sovereign. It's the sovereign that creates law. Um, there is no real law until the sovereign comes to be on Hobbes's view. And so Hobbes goes so far as to say, as he does on several occasions, that no law can be unjust. This is a view that uh, many of us find difficult to accept, but it's not completely clear why it doesn't follow. I mean, certainly it follows logically from uh, Hobbes's premises. So if you don't like that conclusion, you have to go back and un try to figure out where his premises uh, go wrong. Another implication of this absolute and despotic nature, legally unlimited nature of Hobbesian sovereignty, is that international law um, ceases to be something that has any real overriding weight um, in politics, because the sovereignty of the state uh, can always simply uh, shrug its shoulders and choose to override it. Um, here is a very good illustration of this from recent events. This is a uh, as you know, uh, Britain is currently trying to kind of negotiate its exit from the EU. It signed a withdrawal agreement, I think, last year that contained various kinds of provisions. And the government in the last week or two has indicated that it might be prepared uh, to threaten breaking that withdrawal agreement as a way to pressure the EU to make further concessions. And in the context of these negotiations, uh, uh, several senior legal officials in the UK, the Attorney General, the Solicitor General, and the Scottish Advocate General, uh, sent a letter offering legal advice on this. And I just want to quote it from you because it's, it's absolutely perfect Hobbesian reasoning, right? So the legal officials say, UK legislation to remove the possibility of challenge before the domestic courts or prevent the government from complying with the rulings of EU courts would be a clear breach of the withdrawal agreement and of the UK's international law duty to act in good faith with respect to its treaty obligations. Yet, legally, Parliament is sovereign as a matter of domestic law and can pass any law it sees fit, including legislation which results in the UK contravening its international obligations under treaties or customary international law. You couldn't have it any clearer than that. Parliament is sovereign, and that means, at least within its own patch, there is no requirement for it to uh, uh, obey international law. Uh, it's above both its own laws and above the weak T of international customs and legal uh, requirements. Um, the Hobbesian sovereign has complete control over speech, thought, religion, and education. Uh, the church is understood in Hobbes's account to be completely subject to the state. It's not a co-equal source of authority on his view. Um, notice that that doesn't mean that on Hobbes's view there's necessarily a complete separation of church and state. It's true that on Hobbes's account that uh, state authority is completely independent of the religion uh, of religion and the church and above it. Um, but that of course doesn't prevent uh, the Leviathan state from establishing a national church. And in fact, Hobbes thinks it's a very good idea for the Hobbesian state to establish a, a national church. And I'll say a little bit more about that um, in the next lecture. Um, Hobbes says at various points that when we complain about the tyrannical nature of sovereignty, we're just expressing dislike of sovereignty, right? But tyranny and sovereignty for him, as he explicitly says, are more or less um, uh, logically equivalent 
uh, words. Um, there's no right to resist the sovereign, with very few exceptions, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And there's certainly, on Hobbes's view, no right to revolution or rebellion, right? You, 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 you must obey because you've agreed to obey uh, under the terms of the social contract. There are a couple of qualifications to add to uh, this story about the despotic character of Hobbesian sovereignty. One is, yes, there's no right to resist, but there are two albeit very, very minimal exceptions. First, when states are beyond all doubt failing to secure us, when, when law and order breaks down, as in a civil war, then we are freed from our obligations to obey. So if, if, if it's clearly the case that the sovereign is no longer protecting us, we can uh, uh, disobey and perhaps uh, resist. Um, and secondly, when a state is directly threatening an individual's life, she can resist because Hobbes says that the right to self-preservation itself is inalienable. Uh, this is a subtle point, but I want to emphasize it. When he says the right to self-preservation is inalienable, what he's underlining there is that it's not the bare right to self-preservation that we surrender in his social contract. That we can never alienate, because we always have a right to uh, try to defend ourselves when we are uncontroversially under physical attack. Um, the right that we surrender is the right of nature, which is a little bit different. The right of nature is not just the bare right to defend yourself against attack. It's the right to decide for yourself how best to secure your survival in the long term. It's the right to uh, uh, choose strategies um, and policies for how best to preserve oneself and to survive. That's the right that you give up in the social contract. But you always retain the right to self-preservation itself. Um, and, and that means that on Hobbes's view, if the state is uh, directly threatening, if it's dragging you off to the gallows, um, uh, then you have some right to physically uh, resist. And this is not completely trivial. Um, and there are some interesting things that you might want to discuss in your discussion sections here. Um, Hobbes does say that if the state attempts to conscript you into the army during a time where there is a, a really dangerous war going on, you can refuse because Hobbes says um, it's uncontroversially the case that if the state is basically taking you and using you as fodder in, its, in, a, in a very dangerous war, the state is doing something there uh, that uncontroversially threatens your life, and you can therefore refuse. Um, and that's an interesting and rather puzzling uh, exception, and it brings into view some other uh, interesting uh, possible complications in Hobbes's view that you might want to uh, uh, think about. Um, I'm not at all sure what Hobbes would say about Black Lives Matter today, but at least some of those who are involved in the Black Lives Matter movement and those who are sympathetic to it argue that the state has a the American state in particular has a genuine problem about the police being um, uh, tending to target a specific subset of the community, namely African Americans, for greater abuse. Um, and of course, we're all familiar with some of the recent incidents. Uh, that people cite as evidence that that is uh, the case. Um, were it to be true that uh, a particular subset of people is continually subject to the risk of physical violence at the hands of the state, um, it does seem to follow from 1B that those individuals um, can legitimately resist the power of the state insofar as their right to survival is clearly under threat at the hands of state agencies, right? Um, it's a complicated question because, of course, Hobbes also explicitly says that third parties can't get involved. You, you have to defend yourself. So the, the idea here is that, you know, if, if an African-American who is arrested by a police officer has reason to believe, relatively uncontroversial reason to believe, that their life is now really in danger, they can, on a Hobbesian view, potentially legitimately resist by, for example, punching the police officer in, in, in his face in order to get away and make an escape. It's not clear uh, that Hobbes's uh, uh, theory wouldn't say 
that an African American who responded to a police officer or to an arrest in that situation by punching them in the face in order to make an escape, it's not clear that an African American, if we believe that black lives are indeed uh, subject to uh, uh, to an unusual and high degree of threat at the hands of the police, it's not clear under a Hobbesian account that that wouldn't be a perfectly legitimate mode of resistance. Okay, I'm at the end of my time. I haven't finished everything I've wanted to say, so I'm getting a little bit behind. It won't be the first time it's happened in my career as a teacher, so there's a little bit more of Lecture 5 to go, but I have to stop here because we're at 50 minutes. So I'll continue with this line uh, at the beginning of the next lecture and try to uh, pack as much into that, although I suspect this means that I may still be talking about Hobbes in uh, Lecture 7. But um, uh, let's, uh, let's break it off here now so that you don't have to be... Uh, uh, listening to me for any longer than 50 minutes. Uh, thank you. See you shortly.